Hey, hello everyone. We are live. We are back with another episode of In Conversation With on my channel, How to Train Your Gavin. And I am joined by the 2020 breakout star of middle grade, LJ Lipinski. Thank you Hi. so much. Hey. <laughs> thank you so much for being here. I'm genuinely, I'm, I'm made to bits. Like, thank you so much for wanting to be here is the main thing I'm like so thank excited. you this is like the place to be for <laughs> kids and authors this is like you know the virtual red carpet has been rolled out I'm so excited. <laughs> that is <laughs> oh, that is like such high praise i do really think i should be um who was a really big because um l mcnichol said who was it graham norton of middle grade but yes! yeah, <laughs> yeah that's exactly yeah, you uh, that's what. Backwards off the chair, though, are you? Because there's bookcases here. <laughs> no, I'll try not to, but uh, I, I, if I have to, I will press the button. So you've been warned. <laughs> oh, um, Andrew's bought a hat for the edge of the ocean. Oh, Andrew would love to see it. Can you like tag us? Please tag us if you can. Um, Oh, on Twitter, on Twitter. Okay, that's awesome. Uh, so, uh, yeah, hi, everyone. We, sorry, uh, we are here to celebrate uh, the upcoming Strange Worlds Travel Agency sequel, The Edge of the Ocean. LJ, do you have a copy of it? Oh, I do. Oh, my gosh. I don't. I don't, and I feel snubbed. <laughs> <laughs> you should have said I've got 15 <laughs> doing nothing oh. behind me. I would have sent you one as a prop. Ah, oh, but your, uh, your shelves honestly do look incredible. Just all of the spines. I'll tell you what I do have. I have my first Strange Wheels with my red sprayed edges is what I have, so. Oh, that's very special. That's, uh, very that's, what I thought. that's what I thought, but I'm trying to be really careful because every time I put it on the shelf, it falls off. Um, it's there, it's fine, it's fine. Okay, so back to, no back to um, schedule. We are celebrating Edge of the Ocean. It comes out on Thursday, April 15th. Yes. And yes. then I also have pre-order links in the description box as well. So if anybody hasn't pre-ordered it yet, please do so. And also, if you haven't read the first one yet, please do so. But this will be a spoiler-free chat. So you don't have to worry if you have not yet read it. So I'm really happy about it. Uh, and also, like, I'm just, yeah, it's one of my best middle grade series to recommend. It's it's incredible. So anyway, let's get into my favorite part of this, which is the icebreakers. As everybody is tuning in, I want to ask LJ some really fun questions. Uh, oh, I say fun, but you know, <laughs> uh, just as people are tuning in. So are you ready? Are you ready for the first kind of set of random, really random questions? Yeah. 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 Awesome. Let's do it. Yeah. <laughs> Let's do it. Okay, so you're going to roll your eyes at this first one because I, I have asked this like a lot recently, but it's my favorite question. Okay, so don't judge. But <laughs> I feel weird asking it. If you were a wrestler, which I feel like everyone's going to know, oh God, not this one again. But if you were a wrestler, what would be your entrance music? What song would you pick for it? Uh, uh... <laughs> Do you know what? I'm going to go classical, actually. I'm going to say the can-can. We'll come in with the can-can. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That's different. I love it, though. <laughs> it's I love that. And then hopefully I can have, like, chorus girls either side of the, like, walkway, like, cheering me on, proper Moulin Rouge style. Oh. I'll be there yeah. cheering you on. I'll be yeah. I mean, that's not if I'm in the ring with you. I mean, let's hope I'm not. We don't want to be opponents. So, <laughs> uh, just this nice comment from Nina as well. I read the first one, it was so different. The idea was so amazing. Yes. I love it. Oh, uh, Mindy got her copy of uh, Edge of the Ocean. How how dare you? For one. <laughs> uh, yeah. Oh, um, need to make room for the Edge of the Ocean because there are currently five copies of the Strange Worlds Travel Agency on my Strange World. The fact you have a Strange World shelf, Andrew, is incredible. I love that. I'm Hi, so Andrew. jealous. <laughs> Hi, Andrew. <laughs> uh, so, uh, next random question, and this one's definitely tailor made for you. What would you say is Michael Sheen's most iconic role? Oh, that's a toughie. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? I'm going to be really boring and predict, but I'm going to say Aziraphale just because it was having to play someone who's 6,000 years old ha is, you know, irrecoverably in love with his best friend who happens 
to be like who's supposed to be his mortal enemy or immortal enemy i suppose it's just it was just such a fantastic performance and it wasn't reliant on like a traditional sex appeal or anything like that it was just him acting this really ancient being who's got incredibly comfortable living in what should be an uncomfortable situation it's just great oh i agree but any role that he does is incredible like i know he does the um talk show that like, there's something about movies i watch that all the time when it's oh, on but yeah. it never lasts it never lasts long enough it's always over before we know it so i'm just a bit yeah. I may have watched the one where he uh, um, kicks the foot a dozen times. <laughs> <laughs> it, which is the one? Oh, there's one that because when they re recreated, there was one that had me absolutely howling. Um, oh, I can't remember which one it was that he did though. I'm gonna have to rewatch and and uh, do them. Um, <laughs> Sam said, "How can you say there's no sex appeal from David Tennant?" I never said he wasn't. Uh, yeah. Sam, you're <laughs> taking the words right out of my mouth there. <laughs> Rather couldn't roll more, I guess it would be good omens. I mean, uh, <laughs> but to be fair, I would agree. I would agree. Um, so a bit of change of pace now. Which book? I, well, I'm hoping you really like the series, actually, because I have heard you mention a character from a certain book from the series. So I hope you like the series. Um, but which book in the Discworld series do you think is the best? um tiffany aching i'm gonna go Ooh. for um yes um the complete antithesis to um other magical kids you know practi practical magic in the most practical way um she's a midwife she's a nurse she's a an undertaker she is everything practical um, and the witches in Discworld think that you shouldn't use magic if, unless you absolutely have to, which is such a fantastic sort of attitude. The fact that they can use it doesn't necessarily mean that they should. And it's that whole, you've got this power, you've got an access to something that's completely world changing, but you don't have to use it. You are a, a fantastic person. That's what I really like about Tiffany. She starts off thinking that witches are um, people who go out to solve everyone's problems and then as she grows up throughout the series realizes that people are people who can solve other people's problems and that's just such a lovely message so tiffany is my favorite i think Ooh, um sabrina said i do love tiffany but also death death is good yes yeah i definitely do like death i like death's books um i hope that the discord death is the one who comes to get me <laughs> <laughs> see i'm laughing okay um, and pretending that I've actually read this book series, but I haven't. I've never read Discworld before. How awful oh, is that? You, you would I love. Should. You would love Tiffany's book. Start with the We Free Men. You know what? That is the only one I own. So read it. Read I, it, and thank me later. Oh, oh! I'll thank you now. Thank you. <laughs> uh, so, which um, you're just like me, actually. Um, we do like to dress up. And my question is, is there a certain character or kind of a phantom that you like to dress up in or as part of? Because I know I have Frozen, like, what's yours? Let, let me have it. <laughs> I've lost you halfway through that question, Gabby. Oh, sorry. Yeah, of course. Um, can you hear me okay now? Yes. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, and so, you know, with the cosplay, my favourite to do is, like, Frozen and Elsa. Like, that's my kind of favourite role, but also fandom to be part of. So do you have a favourite character you like to dress up as or like a favourite fandom that you like to be part of? Uh, I really like dressing up as Crowley, again, because I've got a good omen shrine in the corner, so I just keep yeah. looking over there. Um, so I really like dressing up as Crowley. Um, one, because I really like his character, and two, his costume is just so comfortable because it's just literally uh, jeans and a shirt. Mm. Um, so it's so nice to wear. But again, then going back to Discworld, I really like dressing as Moist von Lipvig, just because, again, his costume is incredibly comfortable, but it's not subtle at all. His costume, for anyone who's not aware, is a bright gold suit with a gold hat, gold winged shoes. His uh, costume is just gleaming and glittering, and it is very much look at me when you go somewhere. Um, 
so I like that one because it's a character who you can't really avoid if you're a Comic Con. You do walk around with look at that that golden person just wandering around. <laughs> but he's just he's just so much fun, and his books are great as well. If um, if you're into more like a steampunk vibe rather than a fantasy vibe, should try and get into Discworld with. I will. I will. You've convinced me. It's all good. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so I was going to save this question a little bit later on, um, but just to segue into the author questions, but I feel like this is a good time to ask as well. Um, have you ever written a story about a frog on an, an aeroplane? And can you yeah. tell us, can, can you tell us the story behind this? Yeah, so I had an ongoing saga when I was like between the ages of about six and ten about this frog named Pip who lived in the middle of a lovely forest and she had like a seaplane. And she would fly this little plane around the woods, delivering the post and like out into like the lake and stuff because it could land on the water, delivering the post to all of her lovely little animal friends. And I wrote about Pip for years and years and years. Um, um, but, you know, for some reason, no one ever came along and gave me a six-figure book deal for Pip's <laughs> stories. I mean, it's absolutely outrageous. Why am I even here? That is an actual scandal. Like, I feel like now you've mentioned it, though, we're kind of manifesting that and putting it out into the world that this is going to have to happen. So, Hachette or Penguin, you know, anyone, Simon Schuster, Usborne, uh, anyone, anyone at all, please. Do us a favor and pick it up now. <laughs> um, so, uh, I mean, I feel like that kind of, uh, does that kind of instill in you that kind of want for adventure because you were writing that at kind of a bit of a young age? Like, have you always been like, that kind of an adventurous person? Um, you know, having like frog on an airplane, you can go anywhere in the world. So are you an adventurous person in two? where in the world would you like to go if you went on an aeroplane or if you went into a suitcase? Well, I'm, I'll take that from two different angles because if I could go on a plane, I mean, it's no secret. I mean, I've, I've wailed about it on Twitter and Instagram so much recently that, you know, last year my family and me were meant to be in uh, Tokyo watching the Olympics and, and then COVID happened. So that didn't happen. So if I could get on a plane and go anywhere at the minute, it would be, it would be to Japan to actually go and do the trip that I wasn't allowed to go and do. But if I could go anywhere at all, out of space, somewhere else, somewhere that isn't here, like somewhere that no one else who's human has been, perhaps. But I would kind of like Flick and Jonathan's safety net. I would like to be able to have the suitcase in order to get back home again in case it was too dangerous, because I am a bit of a wimp. <laughs> I'm sure that's not true. Yeah, I mean, to be fair, though, same. Um, there's some stuff that happens in the second book. Like again, I'm not going to spoil it, but um, it makes you really. I, I don't know. I kind of panicked a little bit, like for some of it, because I was like, "Oh my gosh!" But yeah, uh, <laughs> it's just so. It's so much fun, though. It's so much fun. Um, anyway, next next kind of random question, and I think it's the last one before I ask the proper questions, the the grown up questions. Um, what were you like when you were Flick's age? Uh, I think I blanked all of that out, actually. Um, when I was 12, um, no, I mean, I mean, I answered this question, um, for, um, a really lovely, uh, interviewer, interviewing for, um, one of, um, the awesome book award, a childhood did you have, we, we very bookish, and mm. yeah, I was, I was totally very bookish, but I had to be because I didn't have any friends, um, you know, I was badly bullied as, as a kid from about age nine through to 17, so, like, I fell into books and stories and imagination because I didn't like what was going on in reality. So I'm just going to drag the mood right down now. Um, so yeah, that that was what I was like. I wasn't at all like Flick. I wasn't confident with school or anything like that. I definitely wasn't good at maths and I would never cross the road. She's a lot braver and more confident and happier than I was. Well, I mean... I I feel like me and you are one of the same then because I also grew up um, kind of like getting bullied as well. So, and I always found that writing would be my kind of escape. Like I'm not a writer like now or anything, but I found writing to be such an escape for myself. So like getting into like the actual official proper questions, uh, what is it that made you want to be a writer? Like, why is that the path that you chose? And did that come from 
um, any of the things that you were going through as a kid. Sorry, what, so, did that sound like really deep? I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 that was fine. Um, I because for me, um, read because I've always read a lot. Um, it seemed like a natural thing to want to do. I, I wanted to absorb a lot of stories, but I also wanted to tell a lot of stories. And I was always doing imaginative play and making my Barbies do things. Um, that you know they had great big massive soap opera lives that went on for years. Um, so I'd always had story lines in a simple A to B it was always these sort of grand scopes um so I'd always wanted to tell stories and somebody must have told me when I was very small that oh you could you could write books um and I wish I remember who that must have been it was it was presumably one of my parents or grandparents who must have said you can write books and that was immediately what I wanted to do I wanted to be an author I wanted to write books and that was what I wanted to do what I wanted to be for for years and years and years until I and then thought well how do you actually do that then because that's kind of like the point where they start saying okay so if you want to do x y and z you need to go to university you need to get these grades you need to get your A to C's and you need to do this that and the other but no one actually said if you want to be an artist or if you want to be an author then this is the path you have to take it was like never a sort of suggested career option it was just always kind of a pipe dream so I genuinely thought that I wouldn't be able to be one like and it was going to be something that perhaps I would do if I got lucky but I so it was kind of on the back burner in the back of my mind for a long time it was what I wanted to do ultimately but I didn't know how to go about doing it um, and even when I went to uni, I went to do English with creative writing because I wanted to have sort of that option and sort of keep that like dream alive. But again, there was no, uh, it was a fantastic course, but there was no sort of um, really black and white career. This is how, what you have to do. But I didn't know when I graduated and I was 22 and I didn't know I knew absolutely nothing. All of that was still in the murky sort of distance. And it wasn't until one of my friends who'd gone straight from the BA to the master's graduated and all of a sudden she had all the secrets. She knew exactly what to do. She knew um, how to get an agent, how to, you know, use the writers and artists yearbook and things like that. And it was like suddenly someone else had cracked the code. So <laughs> instead of thinking I will ask this person how to be an author, I thought she crack the code by two and ended up doing that for two years but by the end of it um I'd finally um uh, left my job as a teacher um and I was lucky enough to be able to have um a year off where I finished my master's and then knew that um fo focusing specifically on getting published was what I had to do to sort of make myself happy I suppose because I was really unhappy in the job that I was in um, and I didn't want to do anything else. I had no like burning desire to have the career in anything to lose. I've got a year off. I'm going to try and do it. And luckily, it all worked out in the end. Phew. I mean, fortunately Sorry, for us, that because was like we... a pot of history of me. <laughs> I genuinely don't mind. <laughs> Liberty, this is all about you. This is the you show. <laughs> so it's all good uh we have a question actually that couldn't tie to that um do you have any tips for people who want to become a writer so when you said that your friend cracked the code uh is there like one tip maybe that you have that could help somebody want to, who wants to become a writer for some sorry my number one tip for someone who wants to become a writer is to write that is it yeah. Yeah. write an entire book if you're writing books for instance or um from the beginning to end, actually do the entire thing, then buy the Writers and Artists Yearbook and start looking at agents. That is literally the only thing I can offer you. You don't have to go to university. You don't need qualifications. You don't need friends in the industry. You don't have to live in London. You don't have to be rich. You don't have to have people who are already friends who are already authors. You don't need a story that people want to read. That is it. And I really wish someone else had told me. <laughs> <laughs> so you are trying to cut corners you know trying to like get agented before even writing something i i, I see you i see you <laughs> uh, so what was it about children's fiction 
uh, that draw like that drew you in rather than writing for I don't know a young adult audience or you know an adult audience. What what was it about children's fiction that made you want to write in that? I kind of fell into it by accident. <laughs> actually um, for my masters I was writing that in the very last year and I had um, a tutorial with Graham Joyce um, the novelist who read what I'd written for my dissertation um, in a very very early draft and he read through it um, and at the tutorial he said well this is this isn't this isn't literary this is young adult and that was a genre I'd never heard of before <laughs> I said oh is it what's that then <laughs> I explained what it was and it turns out I actually read some they were called um so then I started to deliberately seek them out and sort of went back to reading things that I'd read as a child and went back to picking things up new books that were for children and for young adults and realized that actually because I'd sort of been trapped in this sort of little cycle of academia in career stuff that I'd missed out on all this new beautiful kidlet that had arrived in in the interim and I thought yeah this is what I want to do this sort of unbridled magic is what I want to do this is this I was writing it without realizing it and then when I realized I was doing it I wanted to do more oh okay no that's that's really interesting actually um because yeah when I was growing up there wasn't any kind of young adult section or like teen or anything like that it was just like the children's books and then adult kind of there was no segue into one into um the older fiction so uh no that's really interesting actually um so your personal experience getting published getting strange worlds published after um writing it was that a challenge for you were there any obstacles that you had to overcome to to get this book published yeah, Strange Worlds is one of those um, horrendous stories where you where it happened really fast and you have to keep saying to people, this isn't actually how it happens in real life. Um, because I wrote, I had the idea and I wrote the first 10,000 words on that on that same day as I got the idea. And then I panicked and put it away and, and saved the document and didn't look at it for weeks. Um, and then my lovely agent gave me a call around Christmas time and, and said, just just in passing, so what are you what are you working on at the moment? And, uh, and then said, well, I've, I've come up with this, this idea for a, a middle grade book because at the time I'd only been writing YA um, and we submitted two YAs to publishers, both of which had been rejected. So I was feeling kind of miserable um, and suddenly changing age range seemed like a big jump. So I sort of mumbled into the phone that I was going to do try and do this children's book. And she asked me what it was about. Um, and I told her it's about magical suitcases that can transport you to other worlds. And there was this pop and my heart leapt into my mouth and I thought, oh no, she's going to sack me. I finally said something so stupid that she doesn't want anything to do with me. This is the end. Like, I finally put my foot in my mouth. This is it. She's going to show me the door. And then the next minute, there was this noise down the phone, like a screech, which basically, and I won't repeat the exact words, but <laughs> she ordered me to finish it as soon as possible. When can you finish this book? You have to do it. You have to do it immediately. Get on with it. So I did. Um, finished it, but I absolutely churned it out. And then it was sold by the first week of March. And that does not happen. <laughs> but it was I was going to say it. It was the fastest thing that's ever happened in my life. But as a result, um, because it was written and sold at the speed of light, it then needed a whole year of edits to turn it into in, to turn it into this, because it was such a rough draft. The amount of stuff that got cut out of it and replaced was absolutely phenomenal. But the actual like core of the book, if you like has stayed suitcases stayed the same the main sort of plot has stayed the same but like the trimmings have been greatly altered well we can talk about that in a bit as well because i do have a, a related question on all but uh Roz said magical suitcases to other worlds is absolutely what got me to buy the book perfect concept perfect concept perfect execution it was just it's a phenomenal book um do you have any books um that influenced you or the strange worlds travel agency series I think pretty much has been, been an influence. It sounds like a bit of a cop-out answer, but the idea came to me completely like out of the blue. 
Um, so I think everything that I'd read had been like stewing in the back of my mind, like percolating away for ages, just waiting for a little bit of a spark of an idea, um, which turned out to be plot. Who knew you needed plot to write a book? Um, I didn't. No, no, it's crazy. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I think I was always going to write kids going to other magical worlds, but like the how. And so I never sat down and like plotted. I want to write it like a portal fantasy. It just happened when the time was right. So everything that I've been reading so far, like, like from Northern Lights to Pages and Co, they've all been influencers, but they all just had to sort of come together at the right moment, I think. Well, portal fantasy is probably one of my favorite, like, pieces of fiction, I guess. Like, it's kind of like a little, it's own little subgenre, kind of, almost. Like, there's just, Oh, I absolutely love it. It's just that possibility of just going anywhere you want. Um, there is actually a good viewer qu question, which I'm going to ask in a second because it does relate to another question. But before, well, we can talk about Strange Worlds now, the, the first book anyway. Um, and can you just like explain what the series is about, what the first book's about, just in case, you know, anybody who hasn't read it might want to dive into that series? Yep, yeah, so the Strange Worlds Travel Agency um, follows the adventures of Flick, who is a 12-year-old girl who has just moved from her lovely, beloved home in our Little Wivens, which is boring and beige, and nothing ever happens there, ever, 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 ever. Or does it? Because lurking within Little Wivens is a dusty old travel agency, the Strange Worlds Travel Agency. And it doesn't sell you holidays, it doesn't take you to Disneyland or France or anywhere nice on a trip. Instead, it is stacked from floor to ceiling with dusty old suitcases, which are not just any suitcases, as Flick discovers when she talks to the custodian of Strange World. Whose name is that every one of those suitcases can transport you to another world. You practiced that. That's cheating. <laughs> Oh, you did write the series. This a few times. <laughs> <laughs> just a few, just a few. This is like so out there. This is so new to you, but you know, you you nailed that. You absolutely nailed that. I love that. Uh, that's how I want to like describe it to people now. Whenever they want a recommendation in the bookshop, uh, so. <laughs> um, so uh how you mentioned before about how it kind of like popped into your head. So what was the the first seed of the inspiration for you? Like how did it just Pop in a way. I because my original question is like, was it the plot first or the characters? But you mentioned like who needs a plot, like you know, but so I guess was it like Flick and Jonathan who were the main instigators of why you wanted to write the series? It was Jonathan who arrived first, actually, unsurprisingly. Ooh. Um, he waltzed into my head and sat himself down and put his feet <laughs> up on the desk and refused to leave. Sounds like and, him. Yeah. Yeah, and <laughs> he's been there ever since with his personality completely intact and he hasn't changed one bit since that first moment. Um, Flick took a lot longer to turn up. Um, I knew that there was going to be a girl and I knew that she was going to be the main character, but I knew almost nothing about her for ever such a long time. And it took me writing this very, very quick first draft from the, and it wasn't until I got to the end that I actually knew who she was and what kind of a person she was going to be and how she'd react to different situations, beginning and, and doing the rewrites, really quite nice because it felt like I'd got to know her like over the months it had taken to write the first copy. Um, and it was, it was a different kind of relationship because where Jonathan's always felt kind of, not exactly invasive, but he's always been very loud. Um, Flick has always been a bit more shy, but now I feel like I know her really well. Well, you. I mean, you should at this point, because, you know, you are probably writing book three now, so three books in, you, sh you should probably know her pretty well. Um, but I guess um, with you saying uh, how things have changed so much since then, because obviously like, Jonathan strolled in, didn't want to leave. Um, also, Sam's sweet boy, of course. Um, and also, Sam, actually, like, I was going to ask this question myself, actually, um, and LD knows this. I didn't steal this from Sam. But the original draft, when you first started writing it, was there like what were the changes like what was there anything that stuck out to you that you like sam asks like is there anything that you wish you kept that you're allowed to say anyway um there's nothing i wish i kept um everything that 
that was been you know I've been lucky enough to have really good editors work on it so that's that's never been a problem but the biggest change was there was a, a whole other character Flick had a friend who went with her to Strange Worlds right at the beginning um and he got binned straight away oh. he he didn't survive the first edit oh. at all he was cu- he was cut out completely um and at the time I, it seemed like an absolutely massive thing to do to cut an entire character out and all of his dialogue and everything and it it was all the best thing I've ever done. And looking back, I have no idea why he was there. He served <laughs> no purpose. He's better off not being there at all, which is oh, such a strange him. thing. It's so, so strange. Um, he will never be back. He's not going to make a, like a surprise reappearance or anything. He was just there as pure padding. And that is such a strange thing to think about because now I can't imagine her dragging someone else along for no reason like why was he there i don't know (laughs) but also i'm so intrigued i kind of like still want to meet him like bless him he just like slaughtered him he's just gone yeah he's gone he's long gone (laughs) oh bless him but also i feel like it was probably the best decision because um just thinking about the interactions between flick and jonathan especially in the first one but even in the second one as well but again we'll talk about that soon i feel like that would have detracted from their relationship like their friendship as well um so as part of the strange world's travel agency is it writing the characters that's your favorite thing about doing or uh is it like being able to travel to all these different worlds and like use your imagination is that your favorite part like what is it about the strange world's travel agency that you're probably like the most proud of oh that's a big question um I really, really like writing um, character interaction. That's probably my favourite thing to write because I find it really easy to do and it's always the bits that I write really quickly. But I am more proud of the world building side of it and like the descriptions that have come along. Usually because I do them for draft and really sort of flesh out the world. Um, when I'm drafting straight away, I do tend to just like slam it out and say they're in a world with trees and like never come back to that bit until it's finished when I elaborate on what kind of trees they might be. Um, so yeah, I like writing conversations the most, but I'm the most proud of the work I've put into making the worlds nice. Or not Ooh, so nice. I- also that too uh we do see some sinister places and some like really ominous places as well actually um but uh that's actually like a great way of um talking about the world building then then how did you approach it because it is such an imaginative kind of world and you have this plethora of opportunity when you have your character stepping into any kind of suitcase anything could happen so when it comes to like world building and like the the multiverse of your world um how do you well how how do you plan it for one um and also like how do you keep on top of it when you're expanding the series more like are you keeping it in journals are you trying to make sure that um, when flick or jonathan visit one place that the consequences are felt because there are sometimes consequences there's some things that i don't want to say because of spoilers Mm. but there's something else that can can i like communicate telepathically to you right (laughs) now yeah 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 i I know which bit you're on about yeah um yeah i don't know if my editor's watching this um but if she is um sorry but i don't write any of it down (laughs) oh i love that i love that it's raw natural will building it's all in here in here um maybe i'll go crackers one day because of it who knows um but no um the way that i did the worlds for book one because there were so many of them there's 10 um in the first one and i think there's six in the second um someone else will have read it and it will be correcting me no doubt um but Andrew? so there's 10 in the first one anyway um yeah. and because there were so many um And even I was struggling to remember which world was which um, and what name went with what world and and how they were all different. I decided to, um, so one was written specifically to be scary, one was written specifically to be uh, fun, one was written specifically to be intriguing and so on. So even if um, younger readers read it and then couldn't remember what the world was called, they'd know that that was the scary one or that one was the bouncy one. 
I made them so different um, so that Flick would feel a certain way in each one and hopefully the reader would feel a certain way in each one and remember the feeling more than like the name of the place. That's actually really, oh, yeah. you know what, now that you mention it, it does feel a lot more purposeful now, I guess, when you're thinking about the worlds that you do travel to. Um, yeah, that's mm, interesting, interesting. Uh, Roz has asked, um, what world from any book, film or TV show would you like to travel to through a suitcase? Ooh, uh, my first knee jerk instinct there was Westeros, but I think that's probably like the worst Ooh. choice ever. Oh, um, gosh, <laughs> <laughs> dangerous. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we'll we'll scratch that one. Um, no, no. no, I think I think I'd probably pick Discworld. World, if I could go from if I could go to the chalk where Tiffany lives and not Ankh Morpork, I wouldn't really want to end up there down the dark alley. So. <laughs> When I read those books, I will understand, I promise. <laughs> um, oh, what is your favourite Easter egg in the story? Oh, I can't that. tell you that. <laughs> although, <laughs> although there are eight Good Omens references in the first book and three Doctor Who references. So if you spot them all, then you win a prize. Oh, the prize is um, hopefully getting the second book because I'm still waiting. <laughs> Uh, uh, Ross, um, before I go into like the next uh, big question, uh, Ross has asked how uh, has it been having books coming out during a pandemic? Um, do you know what? It's odd because um, I get asked that a lot and I've got no mm. basis for comparison, so it's kind of weird. Um, like, I see people talking about, oh, I miss book tours and I miss going into schools and stuff. Well, I've never had a book tour and I've never been into a school, so I really don't know what I'm missing at this point. It's been they're out there being sold and I have yet to clap eyes in person on a single kid who's actually read them like oh. do they exist I don't know you exist hooray yeah hooray. Hooray, hooray. yeah I'm here um yeah but um I feel like it just shows you the power of kind of the internet as well and like the social media and just how beloved I feel like in this past year that Strange World's Travel Agency has been out just how beloved the series has become for like a lot of us like for me and for like a lot of people on Twitter I've seen they've just been like we love this series so much um and I feel like when Edge of the Ocean comes out next week it's going to be all different it is going to be all different and yeah Sam I, mean, I do have, you, a, I have to do a shout out um to my uh, publicist and my marketing guys at this point mm -hmm. um Dom and Beth if you're there you're amazing um just because they adapted like absolute chameleons to like <laughs> video calls and virtual events they were have been absolutely amazing and I know Beth got commended for um for marketing for uh for Strange World congrats so that's totally that is amazing totally deserved as well totally deserved um okay uh yeah if anybody has any questions uh do let me know in the chat and i will try my best to get ld to answer them um so uh for me um when i was growing up i had zero representation um when i i cannot genuinely think of a children's book i read when i was younger where i felt seen um, and I say that as like a gay man, adult. Um, so for you, um, is it because we have a series where being trans or non-binary or gay, queer, it's so natural and it's not like, um, it's not like uh, when you think about these characters, it doesn't impede them or it's not about them being queer or trans or non-binary. It's not about that. It's about like the story and everything first. But when you think about, um, for me, publishing growing up, I could I wasn't represented. But now I feel like a lot of kids are. Um, so how important is it for you to have a series where, like, it's, it was one, probably one of the first ones actually where I've read, you know, true queer representation for for me. So like, how do you feel um, about having representation now? And is it important for you to have that in the Strange World series? I think it's always important to represent people who actually exist. Um, mm -hmm. Like I, I said this um, a while ago on Twitter when I was in the middle of a rant that um, queer people don't uh, don't appear fully formed at the age of sixteen. Um, are not purely based around who we fancy or our pronouns or what. Or, that we are so much more than that. Um, 
it doesn't necessarily it doesn't mean that your experience growing up queer um is going to be inherently different from someone who's straight but at the same time it is going to be different to an extent um so i wanted to show it as as a completely normal thing it's completely boring i wanted it to be dull the fact that jonathan is trans and the fact that he's gay has absolutely nothing to do with the story he just is that is just a fact it's as it's as unremarkable a fact about him as the fact he wears glasses um not every not everyone does but he does but it's not important that's that's literally as, as deep as it goes um because I can't imagine writing a story where everyone is white and cis and straight and the real world. Um, and even though that's all, you know, perhaps you and I were reading when we were kids um, and throw middle class into that as well. And, you know, we start getting um, getting really into it, you know, because all the kids um, I read about either lived in London or Oxford. And for a long time, I was convinced there were, there were the only two cities in England. Um, <laughs> I still do. <laughs> <laughs> it's um, it's. I don't feel like it's my responsibility to write. Represent there is no way on earth that I wouldn't, because it's my world. It's what I experienced growing up. It's what my friends experienced growing up. And we might not have had magical suitcases, but we certainly had crushes on people who we came across in the supermarket. Yeah. No, I, t oh my gosh, yeah, no, yeah, you're right, you're right, uh, I'm not saying anything, <laughs> uh, but uh, you, you know, you know, I uh, <laughs> Andrew's uh, crying over Jonathan being canonic, I can't say that word, canonically, C canonically, am I saying it right? <laughs> canonically, uh, trans, yes, uh, I, I can never say words, um, so no, I feel like, yeah, that's, you're so right, because it doesn't, like it's so hard to talk about because yeah you're right it's just like a natural part of it just like being gay and trans and that's a natural part of the world so like why should it be something that's the sole focus of something so it's not like this has to be about someone's coming out experience or um about someone falling in love for it to be representation this is just a story a, a fantasy with real people yeah, definitely. It's. I mean, I'm not saying we don't need more coming out stories and romances, and we definitely need more from from writers of color and from other marginalized backgrounds mm -hmm. for for sure. Yeah. But that's not what I like to write. I don't like to write romance, and I would never write a coming out story about a trans man. That's t that's just. I'm not in that lane whatsoever. Um, if somebody else would like to write that, please do. I will buy it immediately. Um, um but that is. It is just. Who Flick and Avery's story in book two is very important to me, even though it's completely in the background, to the point where it could be lifted out and none of the story would be in, would be impacted at all. They are just three young people who happen to be a group of three queer young people. Because as any <laughs> as any young queer knows, all your friendship group will gradually come out one after the other until <laughs> you're in a big group of queer kids all of whom claimed they were straight three years ago. I, yeah, I totally agree. Me and my friendship circle, oof. Uh, you know, I get it. And even now, like, even to this day, and, like, yeah. Um, but I, I totally agree. I totally agree. I would buy anything um, from anyone who is queer, trans, anyone. Um, I love seeing more stories like that. So uh, anyway, sorry, uh, let's talk about the main reason why we're here actually. Uh, and I want to raise a glass to the edge of the ocean for coming out. You have your mug. Nice. Is it cold? Is it cold? Uh, uh, bad actually. <laughs> it's a good mug. Okay. That, okay. That's not too bad then. Oh, I want to raise a glass to the edge of the ocean coming out on Thursday. Um, so cheers. <laughs> So what um, can readers look forward to in The Edge of the Ocean? Well, I hope you all like pirates because that's what's happening. Um, Flick and Jonathan have escaped from their last um, heap of shenanigans and they are off on another one. They receive a summons from Pirate Queen Knife Shabazz. 
fan who's to the point where it cannot be saved. So there is a race against the clock to get a whole world's worth of pirates, mer people, animals, fish, sharks, and ships out of one world and into another. However, how do you sail an enormous pirate ship through a suitcase? And that is the problem that Flick and Jonathan and Jonathan's sort of but not really cousin Avery have to solve in the edge of the ocean. Oh my gosh, again, you were just killing it. You were just a natural. Oh my gosh. <laughs> I'm waiting for you to slip up, but it's not going to happen, is it? Uh, <laughs> Emma's asked, um, can you sum up each of your books in three words? I feel like this would be like a really good way of you describing the edge of the ocean as well in three words, if you can. Um, so for the first one, I would have to say Magical Suitcase Adventures because it's it's quite broad. But for edge, I would say... Mm... <laughs> Do you know what? This is really hard. Um... <laughs> oh, I know secrets and drama oh okay okay now that sounds good that does sound really good i've got three but it'll just spoil it so i'm not saying that. <laughs> i'll tell i'll tell you after i'll tell you okay. after but uh yeah i'll i'll wait until then but um anyway sorry uh was writing the edge of the ocean harder than writing the first one because with the first one like say like me personally i i had no idea it was going to be a thing so like did you have the added pressure of the first one having been released um and did you write it about this time last year as well like is, did you write it over the last year um i wrote it whilst editing the first one so yeah about a year and a half ago now i suppose oh um yeah publishing is weird but it's like i'm getting emails about the future that doesn't exist and it's like i, I don't want to think about next week never mind like next year um Ooh. so exciting this was written whilst um the first book was in its very first edits um but it was like kind of written in slow motion so i've read that and write a little bit more of this one um but it was actually, and it, I know uh, a lot of authors will say that book two was harder, but this was actually easier than the first one for me. Um, I always knew I wanted to write um, a book for Flick and Jonathan where they, they were like sort of confined on a mode of transport. So at first it was a train, um, but then I scrapped the train idea because um, it was it, logistically it was going to be a nightmare and I needed them to have more movement and thought, OK, well, ships, we're going to be on the water. So, but the pipe idea I moved on from there because there were threads in the first book that I wanted to feed into the second book so mm. the second book was kind of written around those threads which were kind of immovable because there's bits that happen uh, in the middle of this one and towards the end that absolutely had to stay in and couldn't be moved under any circumstances but the location in which um, Flick Avery and Jonathan's adventures took place could have changed so it was an interesting experience and it was actually written middle beginning middle end oh okay that that is interesting i would love to see your drafts as you're writing them i mean i know i won't but like i would love it just saying uh you can put in the that. yeah yeah we do yeah we do <laughs> <laughs> maybe when you're yeah you know like rich and famous and then we can have all this uh kind of strange world travel agency kind of merchandise we can say like first drafts that would be amazing i'd love that uh, you keep sh you keep showing up the beautiful co book covers as well can you say um a little bit about who created them because they're amazing uh, but also um you didn't create them yourself is the thing as well but did you have a say in any of it so both of my book covers are illustrated by the wonderful natalie smiley um who um is absolutely phenomenal um mm. so she does um the illustrations for um these and she's also done the map um inside book two um which is stunning oh yes it is it is gorgeous <laughs> yeah authors don't generally have a lot of input um in what our covers are going to be like we um are asked what we don't want um and i was pretty um certain to say what i didn't want like i didn't want a photograph on the cover or anything like that um, but I trust um, the illustrator and designer and the designer um, for those books is Samuel Perrett. Um, I trust them to know what to put on the cover to 
attract readers and to to look nice in bookshops um more than than I would myself but as far as like um fine arts concerned I'm happy to leave it to the professionals <laughs> um the first um time I saw um saw Natalie's uh, drawings I was on holiday I'd gone away for the weekend and I got um, an email uh, through on my phone and it wouldn't load. It loaded the first half. <laughs> and the oh, first half is only up to about Just that there. bit, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, I don't know what's going on in here. <laughs> and I was in the middle of Norfolk, oh. which is only one to miss um, on a good day. So I'm there walking around with my phone in the air trying to get a signal <laughs> to load the rest of this illustration. Uh, it eventually loaded and I was so, so thrilled and, and so happy with it. Um, I think it, I think the first one works really hard because it's got to sort of sell the entire series and not mm. just the story that happens in the first book. Um, and the second one's absolutely great. They asked me, um, you know, what sort of thing would you like to see on this one? And all I could come up with was, was a boat, please. Um, which they... He did, <laughs> but I didn't expect, and I absolutely love the back cover, which is absolutely oh, yeah. glorious. It's got the mer person on the back and the anglerfish and the spine as well, which Jonathan oh. had snuck onto this time. And I just love so, so much. So yeah, I, I feel really lucky about my covers. <laughs> Oh my god, I'm I'm a sucker for a spine as well because mostly when I say my books are always spine on anyway. So to have gorgeous spines. Oh my, oh my gosh. Oh <laughs> This is all I have. Okay, well, that as well. <laughs> <laughs> I like to whip that out every now and then. Uh, Victoria loves the map. I mean, don't we all? Don't we all? Uh, so <laughs> I went off on a little bit of a, a side mission there. Um, what can readers, I know you have to be like pretty vague now, but what can readers expect from Flick and Jonathan? Because they're my favorites, like, and I, I protect them with my life. So in this one, what can readers expect from, from those two? Uh, I'm trying not to give anything away, really. It's uh, it. That that's the hard thing. <laughs> it's a tough one. Uh, for the for for the second one, the first one, I think you can dance around it a little bit more. The second one is a bit tougher. Um, both of them do a lot of growing up in this one in a very short space of time. I would say, um, not literally. They're both the same ages as when they when when they go in as when they come out, but um, emotionally they both go through quite a lot um they both um they both have a tough time i think but for different reasons uh, um and get around what that is without saying exactly what it is um they both get very wet as well <laughs> <laughs> no, I agree with that. Um, <laughs> it's really this is why this is uh, the hardest part of it because yeah, we don't want to spoil anything, um, and you have to be like so utterly vague. So I apologize. I do. <laughs> it's kind of it's watching you squirm and like oh, I don't want to give a spoiler. You know, it's it's. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, no, no, no but, I, I don't mind. I don't mind. It might make people want to read it. <laughs> Well, that's true, actually, um, which actually I was going to say as well, there's a couple of mysteries from the first book. And again, I don't know, like, should I just say what the mysteries are? Because uh, is it written on the back covers? I can't remember. Um, mm -hmm. It's the stuff I mean, about. I it's not too much. It, as, but yeah, I think perhaps you can talk about it as long as we don't say exactly what happens. <laughs> Oh, yeah, I feel like that should be okay. Like, I'll yeah. skirt around it, but like, for uh, okay, there's a couple of mysteries that goes on, and there's a couple of questions from the first book. So, such as the disappearance of Jonathan's father, as well as Flick's abilities, and um, because she is pretty special. Um, so, are we going to get like a lot of? Well, I know this already because I read it. But are we going to get like a lot of answers, or are we going to get more questions? To the mysteries like how did you approach the mysteries in the second one and can readers expect some resolutions hopefully there'll be a bit of a mixture hmm. um hopefully you will not be completely furious with them and hopefully you will want to know more as well um mm -hmm. so yeah that's that's about all i can really <laughs> say there um there is a book three that's what I'll add on to the end of that. 
<laughs> so yeah, there's like, yeah, we don't want everything to be resolved in this one. So it just, the intrigue, the intrigue is so high, just even from the first book going in the second book, which is why as soon as I got the proof, I was like, yeah, I remember, because I, I always have my TBRs planned in advance, um, and I didn't realize I was going to get it that early. So I was like, oh, it's going on. Even though I can't really fit it on, it's going on. And I read it. So yeah, it was, uh, I could not wait because of all the mysteries. So yeah, it was great. Um, the, uh, I know I'll have to be vague again, but um, for the natural progression of the story for you, um, we do have like a more of a piratey nautical kind of theme in this. Um, I, I believe, don't you enjoy listening to the Hans Zimmer soundtrack of like Pirates of the Caribbean and stuff? Is, is that kind of partly why you wanted to have a pirate kind of theme in the sequel? Uh, I actually had to put um, Hans Zimmer in my acknowledgements. <laughs> thank you. Yes, thank you to Klaus Bedelt and Hans Zimmer for producing the Pirates of the Caribbean, the Curse of the Black Pearl soundtrack, which I have played approximately 7 million times whilst writing this book. Um, <laughs> It's just such good pirate music. Um, it's mm. perfect for uh, for writing to. I normally listen to video game soundtracks because they're meant to be written to help me concentrate. Um, and I, I do think that's true. Um, I like a pirate. I like. I was gonna actually sit down and write a pirate book. I don't know, but the aesthetic has been so pleasing and lovely to do. Um, the first thing my editor said when she got uh, the first draft of it was, we need more. We need to know more about this place. I want to know more about this place. Tell me about this. And eventually it got bigger and bigger um, till it was um, the sort of main world of the book, I suppose, which is why, why it's on the cover. Oh, I mean, I've said for such a long time, I want more books with like pirates in them because I am obsessed with, you know, the pirate aesthetics, pirate worlds, just like pirate kind of lore. And I'm just like so happy that we have this in this. And we not just having like the pirate kind of theme, we have a fantastic character, I feel, in Pirate Queen, a uh, pirate queen, pirate cap. No, yeah, it is. She is a pirate queen, cap, uh, Captain Knife. So yeah, she has a lot of titles. She is pretty much Daenerys uh, at this point, but um, she is like really interesting, really um, complex, I feel. So uh, how do I phrase this? Because it obviously can't spoil anything. Um, are, were you excited to write a character like that in this book? And were you excited about writing other characters in the book as well? So like all the new characters like Avery, uh, go. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I don't um... know what to ask. <laughs> Yeah, I really love Knife. Um, I think, mm -hmm. you know, she's really complicated as, as a character. She's not straightforward mm -hmm. at all. Um, I really like her. She is has been written as someone I would like um, to step on my neck, ultimately. Um, <laughs> you, you know? Yeah. <laughs> um, you're going you're gonna, to you're gonna love her. Um, she, <laughs> she's, re she's really great. Um, um, and I and I like writing her. She started off quite two dimensional actually, um, because I just needed someone to to summon them over and to uh, to have like the conversations. But um, but her story kind of um, oh yes, and she writes to people as well. She's she's terribly polite. Um, she is. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, she her story got got bigger and bigger. Um, and uh, you know I could, could quite. She's just. She's very easy to write, even though she's so complicated, probably because she's got such a loud personality. Um, and likewise, with um, a lot of the a lot of the pirates, I've had to give them quite sort of standoutish personalities because there there is a massive cast uh, in this book. In the first one, we've pretty much got Flick and Jonathan and then the thieves and like Darylin and Grayson, who only have like little bit parts who appear and disappear quite quickly. Um, but in The Edge of the Ocean, there's characters who go and need remembering. So all of them have to be quite loud um, or have something uh, to distinguish them from the other pirates. Like there is um, uh, Knife's first mate, Edony, who is covered in tattoos from the forehead down. Um, and there is Jeremy, who is a um, quite artistic and graceful pirate and doesn't seem like a pirate at all. He's very well to do and um, is quite willing to look after people. Um, and there's Captain Burnish, who is extremely loud. Um, you know, massive hair, great big beard, um, 
<laughs> in some regards. Um, Katie, if you're here, yes, you were <laughs> right about the message you sent me. He did do it. Um, and so, yeah, they were all great to write about. But my favourite, and and I have mentioned her a couple of times, I'm glad you brought her up, is, is Avery. Um, she um, is kind... She's Jonathan's sort of cousin, which, which is, I only say sort of because... She might actually be his great great aunt several times removed, or perhaps he's her uncle. They're not, not quite sure. But, um, who was in the Strange World Society, went to another world and stayed there and had a family. And it's all got a bit complicated with time differences and being in different worlds. But basically, Absolutely. they're distantly related. Um, mm. and she is very like Jonathan, but also his complete foil. Um, she's Jonathan from an alternative universe with a different personality. So she's got a lot of his mannerisms, but she executes them in completely different ways. So she was great fun to write. She was like the anti-Jonathan. I love that. That's a perfect way of describing her as well. And I'm not going to lie, I'm when there's a new character in a sequel, I'm always really wary of them. Because like this is like already established. This is an established world. I, I love the characters as they are. So when a new character comes in and changes the dynamic, I'm a little bit like, hmm, like what what what's what's your purpose? Like why are you there? Kind of thing. But I grew to absolutely love Avery. Like seriously, oh, one of my favorite new characters. Like Jonathan's like one of my favorite fictional characters of all time. But Avery, like oh, it, it, if anybody reads Edge of the Ocean and you're a little bit unsure to begin with, say it through because Avery, oh, amazing, honestly amazing. But that's just me being territorial because when I see a new character come in, I'm usually jealous because why am I not the new character? But also I need to give them a chance. Uh, so that's well, why. That's exactly how Flick feels. She is very much, yeah. why are you and why are you here straight mm -hmm. away? She, she doesn't, trust her Avery at all she she's very on edge about her um mm -hmm. and she may or may not have good reason um you'll just have to read it and find out <laughs> what oh, I'll have to reread it now I kind of oh yeah I wouldn't do it uh <laughs> can you tell me uh one thing that you are most proud of about the edge of the ocean um the Fight the almost final scene that happens uh, in the world of the break. Um, I knew what I wanted to happen there before I started writing it, um, before I started writing any of the manuscript. Um, but I had no idea how I was going to pull it off because it seemed enormous, and I didn't, I didn't think I was going to be a good perhaps doing something else just to sort of avoid it. Um, and it took me about two weeks to write this one chapter where this thing happens. Um, but ultimately, I'm really, really proud of how it's turned out. I think it reads really well. Um, when I read it, my little boy, he was hiding under the bedclothes. So I think it's okay. <laughs> no, it's more than okay. It's brilliant. I love it. I love it so much. Um, oh, this comment here. I've seen people include Strange Worlds in Best Spines pictures on Instagram. Ooh. That's so cool. I love that. Uh, how, <laughs> yeah. Uh, how will you be uh, celebrating release day on Thursday? I am going to try, you know, fingers and toes and face masks all crossed, uh, to get to uh, my local Waterstones and hopefully see the book in an actual shop and say hello to it. Um, so that, that's kind of like the extent of my plans, really. Um, I don't want to have like a massive like blowout party. I'm saving that for when the last B, a real life launched and that will be absolutely debauched. Oh, yeah, I mean, we're going to make up for it. Don't worry. It's going to be incredible. Don't worry. <laughs> uh, so a final few questions then is about like kind of the direction of the series or like what's what's to come. Um, are you going to break all of our hearts right now and say that the third book is the final book in the series? No, I'm not going to say that, but I'm going to oh. heavily imply it. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh no <laughs> I, oh, see yes what? it probably yes it probably is but it may or may not be the last time we see flick and jonathan okay um, yeah. okay that makes me feel a whole lot better okay that's great i do like that um how is the writing of book three going are you writing it right now is it right in front of you on the screen can you screen share with us right now I uh, I sent the 
um, the rewrite of the first draft um, mm. because book three is, is quite enormous mm. and out of to last week. So I'm hoping that she will read it and get back to me in a few weeks and then mm. I will carry on writing it. But I know how it's going to end. I know who's going to survive. <gasps> what? Uh, survive? <laughs> hang on, hang on. <laughs> no, don't, don't use words like that. <laughs> that's um that's okay that's ominous Continue. <laughs> sorry sorry <laughs> that just took me by surprise <laughs> the seeds of discontent here you never yeah, you are. i could be doing anything <laughs> no that's true that's true <laughs> i know i know what's gonna happen um uh, yeah i like how it's gonna end put it that way <laughs> i i like the conclusion that book three comes to <sighs> I can't wait. I can't, I, I'm sure I speak for a lot of people and say I cannot wait. Uh, Maxi, I mean, I was going to ask this one as well, um, but any future projects you can share? Is there anything else that you have that's coming out? Um, any other writing projects that you're working on at the minute? Um, nothing else coming out. Um, Strangers 3 won't be out until this year. There, is a, there is another year to wait. Um, I'm at um, sort of a creative point where I'm like, trying out a few new things and drafting a few new ideas but nothing's like completely set in stone I'd really like to um do a contemporary middle grade which is something I've started drafting and been sending bits and bobs to my agent and we'll see if anything happens there but I've got nothing nothing in the pipe that I can share at the moment <laughs> oh, honestly I thought with us being best friends it would like at least you know give me an exclusive or something I don't know <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and then I guess um, finally um, we also have a book birthday coming up this month as well for the American release of Strange Worlds Travel Agency so is there any is, are there any more like international releases like when's it coming out in America I can't remember the exact date is it the 25th it, it's not this month it's next month it's the 25th of next May um, for, yeah 25th of May for Strange Worlds USA um, same book different clothes um, version of Edge of the Ocean comes out in August, so the Americans don't have a lot of time to wait at oh. all. They can read them in quick succession. That's going to be, you know, they they they've won that game completely. They have, they have. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> it's out in, and if I just squint at my poster, it's out in British, English, French, German, Dutch, Slovakian, Russian, Ukrainian, Swedish, Norwegian, Spanish, and Catalan, and is coming out in Romanian and Greek and the US. Oh um, my, god. my god! So yeah. <laughs> It's very full on, yeah. That's the shelf, but that, with, uh, yeah, you, I, but yeah, you I'm, have the I'm best shelves. It's amazing, yeah. Like you, this is beyond a dream come true for sure. I can imagine because I'm sure a lot of debut authors they have to wait a little bit longer, and they may not ever get released internationally sometimes. But you just have boom, 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 country after country. Your books are coming out, which I'm glad. I am really glad um oh i don't i don't know if you could really answer this question if you could do a spin-off of strange worlds what would it be i'm sure you probably have a lot of ideas brewing but you probably don't want to just in case you do actually yeah, end up using I'd them like but do, uh, like, can you i really like to do um like a history of strange worlds mm. i'd like to do like uh ilara Makata's story oh, and cool. what happened to her from when she was younger to founding a travel agency um whether that would actually ever happen i don't know but it's something that i'd I'd like to to write, even if no one would read, I think, um, just because I know most of it, but not all of it. Um, and I think it'd be quite interesting, apart from it would take a lot of historical research, and I don't like research. Oh, fair. Um, oh, Sabrina's asked, when is the Greek version coming out? Do you know? Um, I don't know, actually. Um, I will try and find out. I put all my international release dates on uh, my Instagram, um, so as soon as I know, I will put it on there. Awesome. Oh, my gosh. Oh, my gosh. Uh, okay i guess that's it um thank you so much to everybody who watched but a huge 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 special thank you to my special guest <gasps> oh my gosh i love it <laughs> i love it so much and we kind of match with the red the thingy but like not with a heart oh that's incredible i love it <laughs> we're ending on a high <laughs> I'm like speechless because I love it so much. Uh, I'm gonna have to make myself one of those. Um, 
So yeah, I love it. Uh, but yeah, thank you so much. Yeah, my special guest of honor, Elty Lipinski. Thank you so much for being here. Did you have fun? Did you have a good time? I did. I had an amazing time. Thank you so much for having me. It's been so brilliant. This was a long time coming, so honestly, the pleasure is all mine. Uh, so yeah, again, guys, please do pre-order Edge of the Ocean. All the links are in the description. And buy the first book as well, if you have not yet done so. And follow LT. Yeah, those two gorgeous books. Like, why wouldn't you? Why wouldn't you? Look at those covers. Natalie, if you're watching, you are incredible. <laughs> Uh, so yeah, uh, yeah, the hat is just incredible. So yeah, thank you so much, everyone.